Welcome back to Lost in Citations. Today's guest is Dr. Ali Al Hori from Jubail English Language and Preparatory Year Institute, Royal Commission for Jubail and Yanbu, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Ali Al Hori, welcome to Lost in Citations. Hello, thank you for having me. By the time this interview comes out, there's also another interview where we discussed your paper, your award winning paper which was re-examining the role of vision and second language motivation, a pre-registered conceptual replication of you, Dornier, and Sizer. Congratulations on that paper. Can you just remind the audience of that? Yeah, it was the IRIS award for the repl a replication, pre-registered replications paper using the IRIS database. So congratulations on that. By the time you're listening to this, also there will be an episode with one of your co-authors, Phil Hiver, and the book that we're talking about today is Contemporary Language Motivation Theory, 60 Years Since Gardner and Lambert. And if I'm not mistaken, you just were notified that this book won an award, is that right? Yes, it has won an award from the International Association for Language and Social Psychology and SAGE, wow. and it was offered by the Journal of Language and Social Psychology. It's the Jake Harwood Outstanding Book Award. Well, congratulations. Can you tell the story how you found out about winning the award? Well, I, I woke up one day, you know, <laughs> different time zones, and uh, I saw an email that came midnight, and I just you know, quickly looked at it and I saw that, oh, there was, you know, I thought the the book review that was published in that journal was the one that won the award, the, the one by um, by Abigail Parrish. So I, I, I sent it to Phil and some other people. And, you know, a few hours later, I looked at it again. And then I realized that it's actually our book that won the award. That's really funny. Later. Because when you sent me your Iris Award... It, I, I see what you mean. I was reading it, and it takes a while to realize, oh, that's you. You won the – because it looks, yeah, it looks know, very I general, know. right? It, I know. You know, <laughs> usually, you know, I, I didn't realize that I won the award at the beginning when I, I saw that letter. I was, you know, I was leaving work when I received that email. So I opened my phone. And normally, I'm accustomed to reading decision letters from journals. And for, in journals – the decision is in the second paragraph. Right. <laughs> so in the, in the first paragraph, they say something like, I'm writing to you regarding your paper title, so and so. We have now received feedback from the reviewers. The reviews are at the bottom of this email, end of the first paragraph. In the second paragraph, they say, we regret to inform you that so and so was rejected. Mm -hmm. So the decision is usually in the second paragraph. So in this case, when I received the IRIS decision letter, I skipped to the second paragraph just automatically, and I didn't understand, did we win it or not? <laughs> so, then I had to read it again, and then I realized that we actually won the award. Well, that, that's great. You're going through a great stretch here, and I talked about it with Phil. Didn't you win an up-and-coming early career research award? Or is that Phil? Yeah, both of us. Both of yeah. you. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's from the Association for Language for the Psychology of Language Learning. Right. Okay. So I talked to him about that, and he was like you. He was very humble, and he said, "Well, I still cons consider myself an early researcher, where someone like me would consider you sort of at your peak." I mean, you can extend this peak for many, many years, right? But I, I wouldn't consider like. I, Early career researcher, what exactly does that mean? Well, technically, it's somebody who is in the first five years of their PhD. Mm -hmm. So post five years, you can no longer qualify for these awards. I, I think, you know, that's the standard um, duration. Afterwards, you know, they, they, they don't call you an early career researcher anymore. It's, it's not about the achievements you made, you have made, it's about the number of years after you receive your PhD. Right. Well, congratulations. It's uh, and it's a real pleasure to talk to you again. And I, I'd love to make this a regular thing because you're definitely going through a great period here. We got a lot of uh, things coming out, both with you and Peter McIntyre and with you and Phil Hiver. And it's really exciting 
to read all these things and, and then to talk to the author. So thank you so much. Well, let's go, let's go through a little bit of your background uh, real quickly again, just in case people are listening to this episode first. So you, you have two uh, master's degrees. You have one in applied linguistics and you have another in social science data analysis. And you also have a PhD in applied linguistics where you studied at Nottingham with Dornier. Uh, quite a resume. I think we were mentioning uh, in the last interview why you were able to analyze uh, data and statistics and your, 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 your knowledge with that. You actually had another master's in that. Um, so it, it's, it's quite impressive. I don't know. I almost want to ask you, who do you look up to besides Dornier? As a as a oh. as a researcher, <laughs> that, that's the obvious answer. Right. <laughs> uh, that's a tough question. I, I think Dornier would be, uh, you know, a model researcher for me, and um, he he has inspired me a lot, along with Robert Gardner, of course. You know, the one this book is dedicated to. Well, that's why it was cool to read a little bit about Gardner. Yeah, and and you know the one uh, the one person that actually influenced me before Zoltan Dornier is Albert Bandura, and he is the one who had famously known for the the Bobo doll experiment and self-efficacy. He's the one who you know popularized this idea, and I read his books before I started my PhD, and I influenced a lot. I was influenced a lot by them. What's the Bobo doll experiment? It's it's an experiment I think in the 60s and it it used it was used to ex, to test aggression the effect of watching aggressive like TV shows on your behavior and in the experiment was that they had uh, they bring in an actor beating a big doll and had children watch I know what's what's going on, and then this actor left the room, and it, the, everything was video recorded. And they wanted to see what uh, the ch- how the children would behave after seeing the actor beating up that doll. Mm. And they saw that the children would go and beat up that doll as well. Oh. So they deduced that you know watching aggression leads to aggression. And that was in the '60s, but then, of course, you know, different things happened, and you know, you know, it's not the end of the story. You know, many people said, "No, you know, now are, is are video games going to promote aggression?" Now, there are many people who say no. You know, some people say yes. So it's a big controversy. I mean, but but that experiment was very famous because it was on, on videotape, and it was all over the media. And well, that's interesting because that's kind of around the same era of you know clockwork orange you know where they made they made that person you know watch all (laughs) these violent videos but then they'd inject them with medic you know medication um well and if we're talking about influences it was it was cool to read about gardner especially gardner's influence on mcintyre um and i also talked with uh peter mcintyre a little bit about his relationship well he called him bob which was kind of cool but about the story about how you know he was such a good teacher not only in sort of like the basics of psychology, but also in statistics and how he was very excited to teach about, you know, factor analysis and regression and these concepts that, you know, a lot of people weren't doing in the field. So that must have been kind of cool for you to learn about someone doing this type of research, you know, back in the 60s that you're doing now. And you're, you're really sort of making, you're really making the case that more people should do it now in applied linguistics. Yeah. You know, you know, Gardner is a professor of psychology and he teaches advanced um, statistics. You know, he taught, taught these courses before retiring and now, you know, somebody else is teaching them. Well, it was, it was kind of cool to read Dornier's chapter in the book because he made the distinction that, you know, Gardner's generation were all sort of psychologists first and then Dornier's generation were applied linguists who are applying psychology to implied linguistics. Do you kind of agree with that distinction? Um, I know it, 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 see if it feels weird, even the way you put it. Now, it's applied linguists applying psychology. 
Right. Why aren't they applied psychologists then? Right. You right. Know, that does you know that's there is some some you know some vague points here, and we actually have a paper where we you know the title is the identity crisis in language motivation research, and we talk about these issues. We say, what what are we? You know, are we psychologists or are we linguists? Or are we educators, or or what exactly? And many people do not say we are psychologists, but in reality, we have a popular book series at Multilingual Matters called Psychology of Language Learning. But we are not psychologists. We have now an association for the psychology of language learning, but we are not psychologists. Now we have a new journal called the Journal for the Psychology of Language Learning, who I happen to be a co-editor in chief, but we are not psychologists. You know, it feels we also we have also an uh, a, a biannual conference called the Psychology of Language Learning Conference (PLL), and we are not psychologists. You know it. You know. Something doesn't add up here. So we call this the identity crisis. If you look at Zoltan's books with the word psychology in the title, and these books have become so popular in the field, but we are not psychologists. And then there is a new strand of research in the field called positive psychology, Mm -hmm. but we are not psychologists. You know, I find it hard to see how you can do research and publish your research in top journals related to positive psychology when you are not a psychologist, right? Yeah, I mean, here's the quote from the book. Um, Gardner and his, this is Dornier speaking, Gardner and his associates were first and foremost psychologists who are interested in second language acquisition for various social reasons. I am one of a group of scholars who are second language acquisition specialists interested in psychology because they realized its significance for understanding the life of language classrooms. So he makes that distinguish that he distinguishes like a line in the sand talking to Peter McIntyre. I would say that he would probably classify himself more towards Gardner because he he was interested in psychology before he was interested in uh, language learning psychology. Yes, actually, Uh, Peter McIntyre is a psychologist. He's a professor of psychology. Right. And Robert Gardner is also a professor of psychology, interested in intergroup relations. Kim Newells is also a cultural psychologist. Sarah Mercer, the co-editor of the language, uh, the book series, so, so language, uh, so psychology of language learning with multilingual matters also has a degree in psychology. So the, we are talking about psychologists here. So the point I'm making, you know, some people might say, you know, why do you care about these labels? Does it matter whether they are linguists or psychologists? I would say, yes, it does matter because psychologists are here to represent your training. If you graduated from a linguistics related department, do you have the training to do psychology research? Or are you implying that, you know, anybody can go and do psychology? You you don't need prior training in it. That would be problematic, right? Yeah. So, so of course, I am saying that people should stop doing psychology work in our field because they graduated from, say, a linguistics department. I am, what I am saying is that we should do interdisciplinary research by reaching out to psychologists and collaborating with them, right? Yeah. And, you know, some people say, oh, you know, I heard this argument that, well, yeah, you know, I graduated from... Um, a linguistics department and my training was mostly on you know linguistics and syntax and phonology and discourse analysis and other things but you know I will self-train in psychology and I think 
why did you choose linguistics if you want to self-train after graduation in psychology, right? That doesn't sound right. And the, the, other, the problem with self-training is that, you know, if when you are a student, you are usually doing your degree full time, you have deadlines, you have classes, you have a well-structured course and degree plans set up by experts and you have assignments and tests, you have regular feedback, you have regular course, uh, you have um, dissertation to write, you have feedback on your work. And after four or five years, you graduate and you are called an early career researcher after all this. Mm -hmm. You know, now, if you want to self train after a graduation, you usually have a full time job already. So you don't have the time that you could have as a student. You might have some admin duties, which also take up a lot of your time. You have, you know, in this era of publish or perish. So you are also pressed for time. You have family life and social life. You know how if, if you are as a full time student, you need four years to specialize in this area. How many years would you have to spend if you are just self-training? Yeah, double right. that number, you know, 10 years, it's, it's not efficient. But if we reach out to other researchers and collaborate with them doing interdisciplinary research, that would be more efficient. And this, what I, I call this, the myth of the interdisciplinary researcher. Mm -hmm. We have a, we have interdisciplinary research, which is great. But if you think you can self-train into other disciplines and become a superstar, mm, it's not likely to happen. You know, I know that there are all these anecdotes that, about you know this, you know somebody who was who got the Nobel Prize in one area and then. He decided to switch fields and got a Nobel Prize in another area. Uh, this, there are these stories, but these are the exceptions. Well, they are not the rule. Well, this really applies to me because I was noticing anxiousness impeding people's performance in the classroom. And then I had this idea to correlate heart rate response with self-reports. And I started applying for PhD programs and I kept getting rejected in a linguistic pro and I'm glad I am now I'm studying psychology because there was no pH. So I'm, it's, it's really difficult though, because I mean, in the end it's going to be worthwhile, but my degree will be in psychology at the end of it all, which is, yes, which is interesting, yes. which is very interesting because that I, I didn't know. So I'm, I'm almost like exactly what you're talking about. I was told, no, 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 no. You're studying psychology. You have to study psychology. So I was, I was put in that lane and my, my advisors are both psychologists. Yeah, that, that, that's a great position to be in because many people who do apply linguistics with an interest in motivation and psychology don't have supervisors who are trained in psychology, which is a problem. So I, when I was doing my PhD, I was talking with one of the faculty members at Nottingham and it was my first year or second year. So I was asking him, do you think that psychologists read our work and he said hm, they wouldn't even look at it you know this they wouldn't even think that this is real psychology right and because you know many people don't have this training and the reason why i'm um i recommend interdisciplinary research it's because why limit yourself to psychology you could go and collaborate with neuroscientists mm -hmm. you can go and collaborate with Economists and econometricians, you know, we hear we all we hear all the time about, you know, language learning has these, you know, uh, social status and has this socioeconomic implications, and we have this. Why don't we reach out to econometric econometricians and economists and do research with them? That would be very interesting. We also hear that. You know, there are political issues in language learning, especially English as a global language. Why don't we reach out with political scientists and do research with them? That would be very interesting. You know, I don't think this has ever happened in our field. I don't know, maybe, but, but in motivation specifically, you know, there aren't, you know, real collaborations, 
you know, beyond, you know, the typical sociology and psychology. Do you think it's because the people that you'd reach out to don't want to do it or vice versa? I think, you know, if you sit with people and both parties realize that there is a common interest and there is something interesting to look at, people are willing to collaborate. I don't think it will be a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's just the 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 the, uh, the outlook and the attitude of looking for people, because I think this self training and thinking that we are already psychologists and we are not psychologists is, you know, this attitude is the problem actually. Well, it's interesting because I talked to my advisors today, and one of the things she was pointing out is I was making an argument about social anxiety in the classroom. And she was really poking holes in my argument. She's saying, well, you're not really distinguishing social anxiety in the classroom from any other social anxiety. Like how, how is this going to, so she's really, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to hear, but from talking to you, it's actually good to hear because she's saying, okay, maybe you found a gap in a research area within uh, linguistics, but this is not necessarily a gap in psychology. <laughs> Yeah. So true. it's it's tough. It's tough from 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 my point of view. Um, you know, in in Gardner's work, for example, he distinguishes between uh, classroom anxiety and language use anxiety, and he has different two different scales for them. Yeah, let's let's jump let's jump into the book, um, Contemporary Language Motivation Theory: Sixty Years Since Gardner and Lambert. There's a few stories I'd like you to like you to tell on the podcast. Uh, one story definitely is you and Peter McIntyre asking Dornier to write the foreword. I guess, but let's start out with um, how did how did this all come about in in the beginning? You and you and Peter McIntyre putting this together before you talked to Dornier to do the foreword, and before you talked to okay. Gardner to, to to join. Yeah, yeah. Now let's get, take two steps back. Sure, not just one step. Let's go all the way back. Um, yeah, and. The first time, you know, my, my early, the very beginnings, how I got to know motivation was that I was doing my MA at Essex. And as part of the conditions of my scholarship, you know, there are some elective courses that I had to take that I, I, I could choose what, cor what courses to take. But as part of the conditions of my scholarship, these courses were predetermined. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't up to me to choose what electives to study. But when I went there, one of the courses that my institution asked me to take, I couldn't take it because it was, you know, reserved for, you know, for TESOL uh, majors or something. So it wasn't for applied linguists, so I couldn't take it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I was able to select a course, one elective of the whole degree plan. So so I looked at the degree plan, what, what course to take, I thought about it. And then I saw one course with the title Learner Autonomy. Hmm. So I said, oh, that's an interesting title. I don't know what it means, but let me take this course. And this proved to be a life-changing decision. Hmm. Though I didn't like the textbook, I didn't enjoy the course, I didn't, you know, I, I finished the course and passed the course, I didn't know what the hell that course was about, you know? <laughs> so why was that life-changing decision? I tried decision? to read the textbook. Mm -hmm. Maybe my level at the time, I wasn't ready or something. I didn't understand the point that the author of that text was trying to make. So I didn't know why I didn't enjoy that course and I didn't get the point out of that course. I remember in the assignment that we had to do, I wrote something like, you know, the autonomous learner or autonomy means, you know, everything you want the ideal learner to be is an auto autonomous learner. It's the, the ideal student and, you know, just the perfect student. There is no clear definition of what an autonomous learner is, just everything you want it to be. You know, I, I kind of criticized this idea mm -hmm. and then I passed the course. And I didn't think about it again. And I went back to Saudi Arabia. And after a while, I applied for the scholarship for my PhD. And then I said, I said, okay, so let me now go and, you know, 
review the textbooks of my MA degree to start thinking about what I will do in my PhD. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, so let me grab that learner autonomy book again and try to read it. Maybe this time I will understand something. <laughs> and again, I didn't understand anything out of it. <laughs> but while rereading that book, I saw that, you know, there was a sentence saying, if you want to read more about motivation, check out this upcoming book, Zoltan Dornier, in press, um, teaching and researching motivation. Mm-hmm. I said, huh, motivation, what's this? Let me get this book. So I ordered this book from Amazon, started reading this book, and suddenly I said, okay, that's what I want to do research on now. Not learner autonomy, it's this one. <laughs> so, so, and then I sent, as I said, I sent an email to Zoltan that was like, I don't know, 2009 or something saying, I want to do a PhD with you. And at that, and he said he was too busy and he needed like three or four years before he could accept new students. And at that time, I didn't tell him in the email what I wanted to do research on, but had he asked me, I would have said, I wouldn't, I would have, I wanted to do research on Gardner's socio-educational model, oh. and in, par- in particular, the effect of peers and peer influence. Because if you look at the model, there is one section for attitudes towards the learning situation, mm-hmm. and under it, there is attitudes towards the teacher and attitude to- attitudes towards the course. Mm-hmm. And I asked myself, but, you know, peers also play an important role. There is nothing about peers there. Mm. So I thought, you know, that might be an interesting, you know, research topic. And then when Zoltan said, you know, I can't take more students now, I started reading more and more of his books. Then I, I thought, wait a minute, if I'm doing this, if Zoltan is going to accept me as a PhD student, it would make sense to do research on his own new theory, right? You might go back to somebody else. So, you know, at that time, you know, I then the his book, uh, his 2009 book edited, co-edited with Emma Oshioda appeared. So I ordered that book. And I remember when I was reading it, part of the time was I was at the garage. At the time, I had an, a Caprice, an, oh, a classic Caprice 1988. And I used to commute 200 kilometers every day to work. Oh. And it was, it was a reliable car, but, you know, it required a lot of maintenance. So I needed to, t- to take it to the garage, you know for various things. And I used to take Zultan's book with me to read while waiting and (laughs) smelling the engine oil and everything. (laughs) And as I was reading this book, it was published in 2009. And that very year was the 50th anniversary of Gardner and Lambert's paper. Hmm. And I was reading that book I didn't see any reference to this fact. And if anything, people were implying that, you know, Gardner is old, you know, let's, you know, get over it and move somewhere else. And I was reading it. I'm looking for, you know, any reference to this anniversary, but there was nothing. I said, hmm, that's very strange. Why didn't anybody bring it up? Then I I saw that Peter wrote a piece somewhere else. Uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary. Uh, but, you know, this idea of celebrating the the anniversary stayed in the back of my mind. And then I started studying with Zoltan at Nottingham. And in 2014, Zoltan hosted the first international language motivation conference at Nottingham. And I happened to be there. Nice. But at that time, it was the time for my data collection. So I had to go back home to 
to collect data. So I said, wait a minute, there is a conference coming up and then there is my data collection, you know, and it was a tight time. I need to go back home and catch the students during, you know, during the semester, not during holiday. So I sent an email to Zoltan saying, you know, I know that this conference is coming, but I can't be here because I need to travel to, to collect data. Mm. And he replied to me saying, you know, something like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> your supervisor is hosting the biggest international conference on motivation at your own institution. And you want to leave for data collection. What do you mean? I said, oh, okay, okay. Now, now I got the perspective. I will stay for the conference. <laughs> So at that conference, I met Peter McIntyre. Ah. I met I met Diane Larson Freeman. You know, Phil was talking yep. about the trip to to Sherwood. Yeah. Uh, I met you know Kim Noels. I met Emma Oshio Oshioda. I met you know all these big names for the first time. So that was the first time I met with Peter. I got to know him. We didn't talk about anything because I was you know just. A, you know, a big starting PhD student, but we you know we got to know each other. He he read, you know, I wrote a chap, I published a chapter by that time, so he read my chapter and recognized me. But in August 2016, there was another conference, well, two conferences. It was Euro SLA and the Psychology of Language Learning PLL2 in Finland. Wow. And they were back to back, so people could, you know, go to both. So I went there, and I saw Peter there again. Hmm. So I took him, Zoltan wasn't in that conference. But I took him aside and said, you know, I have this idea. The year 2019, we are still in 2016, so still hmm. three years ahead. Hmm. So the year 2019 is... The 60th anniversary. We missed the 50th. There was nothing for the 60th anniversary. I said, "Wow, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, let's do it." And because that was PLL2, pretty much every motivation researcher was there physically. Mm. So we went around. We we talked with people. You know, we uh, I there was Emma Oshioda. There was uh, James Lantolf. Merlin, uh, Bonnie Norton, um, I don't know, Rebecca Oxford was there. So they were there, Elaine Horwitz. So they were there, and we, when we approached them face to face, it wasn't like cold calling. It was, we know we have, we are, we have a good cause. It's celebrating Robert Gardner, none other than Robert Gardner, the 60th anniversary. It will be a big anthology. And uh, it's by invitation only. So all these people agreed. So we took the verbal agreement from them. And at the conference, there were multilingual matters were there. So we approached them and pitched the idea to them. And I said, oh, yeah, go ahead. Write us a proposal. So in 2007, you know, it was August. So it was then holiday in in 2017, early 2017, we submitted the proposal to Multilingual Matters. In April, you know, a couple of months later, they sent us the contract. They said, okay, the reviewers like the proposal, let's do it. And we asked for a deadline for the first manuscript at the end of uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. So this gave us like a year and a half to for the contributors to write the uh, their chapters. So we submitted the, the manuscript at the end of 2018. A couple of months later, we heard back from the reviewers, all positive feedback, you know, with some revisions here and there. We did it within a month or something. And then we sent it up, sent it back to the publisher and in july 2019 we received the proofs then there were a few things about references about things we finished them and then in september 2019 the book was finalized so if you 
open the book, mm-hmm. it actually copyrighted 2020. Mm. Even though the website says 2019. And this is a bit confusing because according to APA, you should cite the copyright year, not the year it appeared, because the book might appear at the end of the year, but is copyrighted the year after. Well, they should make a so, special. They should make a special exception for you. Come on, it's the I mean, sixty I mean, year anniversary. I mean, I mean, it, it doesn't matter for us, you know. Twenty twenty yeah. is a good year, you know. Though, yeah, but fifty nine, fifty nine to two thousand nineteen. We need it. We yeah. need it nice and clean. Well, what about Dornier's contribution? When oh, did, yeah. when did that? Finish? Yes, yes, yes. So, as I said, he wasn't in the conference, so we didn't talk to him about it face to face. But when I went back from Finland to Nottingham, I wrote him an email and saying, well, I have great news. You know, I proposed this idea about, you know, an anthology with Peter and multilingual matters are interested and all these big names are, all these big names are interested. And, you know, I don't know how I put it. And when he, my intention was to invite him to contribute. Mm-hmm. And when he replied to me, he said, yeah, good job or something, you know, nice to hear this. Mm-hmm. And didn't say yes or no. Mm-hmm. And I said, mm, that's weird. Why, why didn't he say yes or no? So I replied to him saying, so are you interested in, in uh, writing something? He said, if you look at your email, you didn't ask me to contribute. You just told me that you have this book. Mm. I said, wait, that, that, my intention was to invite you to write something. So he didn't, wasn't willing to write something. He was too busy and everything. Mm-hmm. So I told Peter, I will get him later, you know. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, leave, let's leave this to later. <laughs> and then when the Smart. book was, you know, almost ready, you know, we, we uh, it was, you know, it was Peter who contacted Gardner because he is in touch with him and asked mm. him to to um, write something for the book. And Gardner agreed, which was a big deal for the book, of course. Mm-hmm. And then we contacted Howard Giles, and he also agreed to write the epilogue, which was great. And then we were at AAAL in the United States. And Peter and I was there, were there, and Zoltan was there. So we said, let's um, approach Zoltan face to face again. You know, when you do it face to face, it you it almost always works. You know, <laughs> if you call call somebody by email, it's easy for them to say, oh, I'm too busy. You know, maybe you know next project or something. So we went to him, and he. I think he was leaving. He was on the, you know escalator or something so we went to him almost running and he looked behind and so us and he said okay we have proposal to you we are about to finish this project and we would love if you write just a short piece you know just two pages nothing you know uh, is just to so that he doesn't say he's too busy <laughs> yeah just you know two pages if, if you don't <laughs> mind you know just you know <laughs> He said, um, that sounds interesting. Who's contributing? And we said, we have, you know, Emma Schoeder, Africa Oxford, Bonnie Norton, uh, Lalonde, Clement, and Lantov, and Swain, and Jean-Marc Duwiley, and all these people. I said, oh, that's interesting, all these people. And then he agreed. So, you know... It, you know it, I don't think he would have agreed if it wasn't a face-to-face request. Mm. That is a great story. Can you tell me? I don't. I'm not familiar with with Howard uh, Giles. Howard Giles is the editor of the journal um, journal for of the psychology uh, of language and social psychology, and he has been publishing since I think the 70s or something, and he is interested in accent and. And attitudes and and other things. Okay. Well, yeah, he's, can, he's more into psychology and social psychology. Can we talk a little bit about the original paper, Motivational Variables in Second Language Acquisition, 1959? Do you mind? Can we just briefly? 
Yes, so that paper, originally, uh, pre that paper, when people looked at um, how people could or couldn't learn a language, the primary factor that success and failure was attributed to was intelligence and aptitude. Mm -hmm. If you have the aptitude, you will succeed. If you don't have this aptitude, you will not. Mm -hmm. And so Gardner decided to look at the affective factors of um, mot uh, motivation and, and emotions and other things. And he, his major argument was that, yes, although aptitude is important, we have to also look at the affective factors and motivation. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the beginning of this. And he, in one of his publications, he mentioned this, anecdote, this story. He says one day he went to his supervisor, Lambert, mm -hmm. and during the conversation, he said, I don't understand how somebody could learn the language of a group, could, you know, could learn the language of another group when this person doesn't like that group. Mm -hmm. and, and his supervisor, Lambert, said, there you go. This is your research topic. Let's do it. Mm. Yeah. And that was the start of it. That's great. Yeah. I, I was reading uh, the paper today, the 1959 paper. And, you know, the whole notion of language motivation starts with the family, branches out to the community. And, uh, you know, I never really thought about that before. It's, and, and then I, it kind of makes me happy. I, I talk to my parents on Skype. I try to talk to them once a week. And now I'm thinking, wow, this is a huge motivation for my daughter to practice English because she's reaching out to her family. So it kind of, it kind of made me, it kind of made me happy in a way that this could be a motivational factor to help my daughter because, you know, here in Japan, she, you know, her mother speaks Japanese her all her friends speak Japanese, her school's in Japanese. I can see her motivations really not there unless I take her to America, which I can't physically do now. And the other way is just reaching out to my parents. And I do notice like if, if we consistently talk, like even once a week, her English gets a little bit better. Um, and I can see how that's complicated with the whole idea of a global English, right? So yeah, you have to learn English, but it's not really a community, or is it? So, I mean that that whole concept. These it's kind of cool. Even that anecdote you said, like that simple concept, can branch out a whole, you know, arc of research, which is it's really fun to read these kind of books and go back in the history. Yeah, I kind of wanted to talk briefly about your. I, I mentioned this before we we did the the podcast, but your personal opinions about motivation before you did your PhD with Dornier, did they change at all? Are they the same? Um, now that you know more about motivation, do you use it to propel yourself in your own career? Do you find yourself thinking about your own motivation for different kinds of, kinds of tasks or how different variables affect your motivation? I know we talked about on the last podcast that you try to do research uh, three hours a day and you self rate yourself if you reach these goals. And so, I mean, that's, that's all related to it, right? Uh, these, I mean, even talking with Phil Hiver about, you know, your complexity theory about these dynamic relationships, everything's changing, everything's complex. I just wanted to talk like in a basic way about motivation, like how it relates to you personally and how it's changed over the years or has it changed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there are two parts to this question. First, Personally, yeah, my knowledge of motivation has helped me self-regulate my own learning. Mm. You know, I, for me, I, I was talking with Zultan the other day about this, and I said, it doesn't make any sense to be a demotivated motivation researcher. <laughs> it's like an, an oxymoron, right? You know, are you really a motivation researcher? That doesn't make sense to me. You know, why don't you apply it on yourself first? It makes sense now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so all these tips and all these techniques that psychologists have come up with in 
in in these in past in the past decades there are so much that you can apply to yourself like goal setting like goal orientation whether it's mastery oriented or performance oriented there is self efficacy there is mindset there is self determined motivation there is, is so many things that you can use and draw from to motivate yourself if you want so i you know that helped me a lot so yes it was a big impact on me the second part of your question about how i my perception of motivation has changed at the beginning you know this the fundamental idea that the field has is which originated with gardner is that you know your attitude towards the out group uh, will affect your motivation and eventually your success to learn their language mm. and this led to the idea that learning a language is different from learning other school subjects mm -hmm. so learning is a special case to quote emma oshioda and Zoltan talked about it several times, Gardner talked about it several times, and it's just an assumption that pretty much everybody agrees with, that what we are doing is different from what other people are doing when they study, say, the learning to make, the motivation to learn mathematics, or the motivation to learn science, or the motivation to learn any other STEM or non-STEM subjects. You know, language is special because there is this social aspect to it. And then there is this intergroup relations aspect to it. And then global English came. And suddenly there is no outer group to identify with, right? Mm then suddenly there there has been some confusion about you know there was confused discourse at least you know the way i see it in the field whether language is special or not special now is it global language and we actually wrote a paper on this we call it the fundamental difference hypothesis mm. which it means that the idea that learning a language, whether it's second or third language, whether it is a global language or not, is fundamentally different from other school subjects. That's the hypothesis that, you know, everybody has taken for granted. And I didn't think that I had, you know, over the course of the years, I developed some skepticism about the validity of this hypothesis because I asked, started to ask myself why is it that learning a language should be different from learning other school subjects because in the end most of our theories are actually coming from psychology right and we are adapting them we are adapting the ideal L2 self from the ideal self which came from psychology we're adapting linguistic self-confidence, originally coming from self-efficacy. You know, at least this is the you know original thing. You know, it might be slightly different, but at a fundamental level, it's self-efficacy. So all these theories, whether it's self-determination theory, whether it's goal-setting theory, whether it's mindset, whether it's these different theories, all coming from psychology. So we adapt them, and then we say we are different. So for me, that didn't make much sense. So Phil and I said, let's do a study on it, a big, large-scale study, and test this hypothesis. So we collected data from participants on their motivation to learn three school subjects. Mm -hmm. Their motivation to learn English, which is the L2, the global language, their motivation to learn Chinese, it was in Korea, mm -hmm. so it was their third language, and their motivation to learn mathematics, which is a non-language subject. Mm -hmm. And our hypothesis was, if it's true 
that language learning is different than learning English and learning Chinese should be more similar to each other than they are to learning mathematics. Mm -hmm. But this hypothesis was not supported. They were they looked pretty much the same. Everything is the same. So we couldn't find evidence for this hypothesis. And and in our literature review, we, we also review other work that has more or less shown that there isn't much difference. There is work by Peter McIntyre on applying Gardner's model into learning music. Mm -hmm. And it works well. There is a study by Gardner himself applying his own model into learning six. Mm -hmm. And it it also worked well, and so we say we said. So what's this idea about you know learning a language is different from learning other school subjects, and we proposed that it's more conducive to think of motivation, whether to learn a language or to learn other school subjects, using Chomsky's metaphor of principles and parameters. So Chomsky had this idea that um, learning a language is about principles and parameters. There are principles that are relevant to all languages and then there are parameters that are different from language to another. So we borrowed this, this metaphor to apply it to motivation and we said we don't need a distinct motivational theory for language learning and then another distinct motivational theory for some other school subject like mathematics or something else. We could have one motivational theory and this theory could fit the learning of different school subjects depending on the circumstances surrounding these school subjects. It doesn't have to be a fundamentally different theory. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what my advisor was saying today, um, where I was making the point that, that, look, I think these learners have anxiety because they're afraid to make mistakes. And they're afraid to lose face. And she's saying, well, I don't know if that's really unique to Japanese learners. But I would say there, there, someone should probably do a study where they compare compulsory L2 language learning, like, like Gardner did, uh, compulsory French in, in, I don't know, Western Canada or even Eastern Canada, or compulsory English in Sweden or you know Denmark or one of these countries that have so many bilinguals or compulsory English again your study uh, in Korea I I just think I mean I could be wrong but I gotta think there there's more psychological factors depending on your location and depending on which language you're com you, you've you've been you've been forced to take yes definitely there are different and that's the parameters would come in you know in different contexts different factors will be at play, but all these factors are explainable by, a, you know, a general motivational theory, mm. right? Yeah. So self-determination theory, for example, you know, you, you could apply it to this context and you come up a different configuration, then you apply it to a different context using a different configuration. And so it's, it's, it's more or less the same global theory, you know, the, the, the destructive thing that would come from the belief that we are special and we are different is that we will have no reason to keep up with the literature in other disciplines, right? And we say this is not relevant. We, why should we have conversations with them? Why should we read their literature? Why should we publish in their... Uh, and this brings me to the interdisciplinary research that we talked about previously. Mm. We are kind of building artificial walls to isolate ourselves from other disciplines when they are in fact doing something that is relevant to us. That is, I think you just really helped me out a lot. Because the thing that I was battling with is I, I found a gap um, and then my advisor saying, well, maybe it's not really a gap in psychology. Uh, and so she's saying you need to update your you need to update your citations, like all your citations about heart rate and language learning anxiety are too old. Like they're they're you know it's just you're just talk you're just re referencing McIntyre 2014 or 
McIntyre's review in 2017, I think she's saying what you just said. I need to, I need to branch out to other disciplines. Like what are other disciplines doing? But at the same time, I think she still wants me to find citations in, in applied linguistics that relate to my gap. Like what advice do you have for researchers that you, you have to find? How do you do that? Yeah, one trick to go around this issue is to look for a study that's asking a very similar question to yours, but using a different methodology. Mm -hmm. And you say, look, this did this study, but they did not account for physiological point that you are looking at. Oh. You see? There you and go. then the, these people also did another study also on this idea itself, but again, they didn't account for the physiological aspect. Mm. And this is important because so and so. So you can go around it with this trick. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Oh, this is great. I, um, I guess I just had like two more things I wanted to, to talk to you about. Then we can kind of wrap it up. Um, in the chapter that you wrote with Peter, you highlighted individual differences. And this is something that Peter talked about in his interview as well. He was he he said, I you know, I'd like to promote people to do more individual research. And this is something that I'm really interested in as well. I guess it is difficult because it's hard to do individual research with uh, large sample sizes. But I'm quite fascinated in individual research, kind of bringing it back to me asking you personally about your motivation. Uh, for example, in a one-to-one -one Japanese lesson, if I perform poorly, I get extremely embarrassed, extremely embarrassed and uh, ashamed. And I start beating myself up on the inside and I'm not even listening to what the teacher's saying. Like she's trying to help me, but I'm already lost. I'm a lost cause. But the next lesson, I will I I hate the feeling of embarrassment so I will I will work hard to avoid that feeling in the future. Now I get that it's a one-on-one -on -one environment um but I know that like people being embarrassed in a classroom can be a demotivator, right? But I actually look at it as a different way that if I'm embarrassed in any situation, I will try to avoid it no matter where it is. So I think it's I'm, I'm opposite to people that would be demotivated by that. I mean, do you find yourself like everyone's a little bit different, right? We can't group everyone together, but we, we have to in some of these large scale studies. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I remember Zultan, you know, mentioning this and he was saying that when we when we do individual difference research, we study the group and not the individual. So we do a study on like 50 people or 100 people or 200 people, and then we make conclusion, and then we want to import these conclusions to the individual level, and in many times it doesn't work. As you said, you know, you have this conclusion that, you know, anxiety, or uh, shame will, you know, be demotivating. And then there are people who will actually be motivated by it. Right. So it doesn't really f always fit neatly at the individual level. So this is kind of, you know, the irony of doing individual differences research when you are not really studying individual differences. And historically, individual differences has been concerned with identifying discrete factors that have predictive validity of important outcomes like you know achievement and success in language learning but then and and zultan talked about this in in his recent in some of his recent books that this idea has been questioned because is is are there really discrete factors things are dynamic just as you said and they are changing the whole time and they are there are they are interconnected this leads to the other and then the other leads to this and it's not actually monocausality it's not like only when somebody has this level of motivation they will achieve this. There are so many other factors 
as well. So you are interested in anxiety. And for example, Gardner's view in some of his findings, he found that the role of anxiety in his model is that, you know, to quote him, it has a dampening effect on the relationship between ang between motivation and achievement. Mm. And a dampening effect is, you know, technically it's called a moderator, which means that the strength of the relationship between motivation and achievement is moderated by the third variable. This variable can make this association stronger, could be weaker. So if there is high anxiety, then the association between motivation and achievement will be weaker. Mm. If there is low anxiety, then the association between motivation and achievement will be higher. So it's not straightforward. It's not just motivation leading to achievement. There is anxiety and there are so many other factors as well as at play. And we all know this in real life. It's not just one or two factors. So to what extent can you say motivation as an individual difference factor leads to achievement like in, in like in my research i i in this proof of concept i'm exploring the correlation between self-report and heart rate and specifically self-report of 10 different emotions and it turned out two of the emotions did correlate with heart rate but eight of them didn't so we're not we're only going to be talking of well i am going to be talking a little bit about the others but i looked at the data and some people were completely opposite so like uh -huh. the, the heart of the conclusion that, okay, well, these two did correlate with this proof of concept with this small sample size, but I was looking at like the individual data and some people, Ali, were, were actually complete opposite. I'm talking on a scale of one to 10. One person said one, the other person said 10. And one person said uh -huh. 10, the other person said one on the same emotion. And, and I thought uh -huh. this is, this is, this is, this is crazy. They're, it's exact that these two people are experiencing things totally differently. So I think like there's interesting things in that data, but I can't, I don't have, you know, I don't think I'll be able to go into it too deeply, but I am interested in these individual differences. It's like, wow, these two people are experiencing two differently, two different things, totally different, at least internally. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is called the moderator that you could have, you know, one hypothesis is that you have a moderator in your data. Mm. And so, so what this basically means is that you have at least possibly two groups in your data set. One group that behaves this way in these circumstances and another group that behaves another way. And this could be the hypothesis that you could test in a larger sample. Mm. Mm. All right. I guess. All right. Last question, and I know this is very, uh, very selfish, because um, I, I like to talk about anxiety. Oh, by the way, Evernote. That was the tip that you gave me and the listeners last episode. I don't know how I ever lived without this. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> I yeah. I love it. Okay. Uh, just I don't I I, I don't know if this is going to be a quick answer, but. I just have trouble finding exactly where anxiety is situated in these models, uh, the so Gardner socio-educational uh, model and the integrative model. It's not really specific. The anxiety isn't really explicitly listed. Can you explain to – I mean you mentioned that it's a moderator. Um, I know he's he sort uh -huh. of correlated or associated it with attitude. Um I just feel like anxiety is kind of a murky thing in uh yeah it, it's just not really clearly defined in, 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 yeah. in a lot of the research yeah i would think that it anxiety fits in the if you look at the his the figure of gardner's general model the socio-educational model motivation is predicted by integrativeness mm -hmm. And attitude towards the learning situation. This is the integrative mot integrative motivation. Mm -hmm. And then motivation is pre also predicted by other motivation factors. Mm -hmm. it, it's outside the box. Yeah. I I think this is where anxiety and the other factors. I think this is where Gardner would place them. I see. 
Okay. Well, uh, the book is is great. Contemporary language motivation theory, 60 years since Gardner and Lambert. I love that one section in the book where they're saying, well, let's, let's do this again for 70, 80, 90, 100. And, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I will put the link to purchase uh, the book and the link for the original Gardner. I found the link for the original Gardner paper and Gardner's dissertation. I'll put those links on the website. Thank you so much for coming back on Lost in Citations. Thank you very much for having me again. If you'd like to contact the show, the best place to find out about us is our website, lostincitations.com. Here you can learn more about the background to this project and how you can get involved. Our hope is to help academics, educators, and online content producers get in contact with each other. Our email address is lostincitations at gmail.com. We also have Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Please rate and comment on the sites you use to download your podcasts. It helps us reach more potential listeners. But probably the most helpful thing you can do is, if you like our content, recommend it to a friend and let them know what we're trying to do. Thank you very much.